Marion Elizabeth Rogers' biography, Mankin, an American Iconoclast, is a compilation of archival interviews, love letters, and FBI files that shed light on the public and private life of the journalist. Next, she'll talk about H.L. Mankin for about 40 minutes. New biography titled Mencken, an American Iconoclast. In it, she profiles the man considered by many to be one of the most influential public voices of the 20th century. Some of the uh, advanced praise has been quite astounding. Kirkus Reviews said a superb study, the best biography of Mencken to date. Publishers Weekly said, as Rogers shows in this thorough work, Mencken was more than a newspaper man and prolific author. This is a meticulous portrait of one of the most original and complicated men in American letters. Charles A. Fletcher, editor of The Diary of H. L. Mencken and author of Mencken, A Study of His Thought, says the most complete and most living picture of H. L. Mencken that has ever been attempted, written with vividness and even poignancy. This is a definitive biography. Mencken was a newspaper journalist, famous wit, and constant figure of controversy. Rogers, Ro excuse me, Rogers takes us through his professional and personal life from turn of the century America into the roaring 20s, through the depressed 30s and the home front during World War II, capturing the irrepressible spirit and irreverent charm for which Mencken was famed. Sure to be a must for any consumer of biographies and American history, please join me in welcoming Marion Elizabeth Rogers. Thank you very much. I appreciate your being here this evening, especially because it's so rainy and so foul outside. But I know what you're thinking. Another biography on Mencken. There isn't anything new to say about Mencken. Ah, ye of little faith. Well, it's true. You could spend a lifetime researching H.L. Mencken. He's been called the most volcanic newspaper man ever known. In an age where journalists are pegged as being from the left or the right, Mencken defies categorization. Some called him Horrible Henry, some called him worse, but few could remain indifferent. He began his career as a journalist in 1899 when technology had not invaded the newsroom. In fact, a telephone, when heard at all, was regarded as a toy. His newspaper career ended in 1948 after television had made its debut. And during the years in between, Mencken wrote literary and social criticism, a newspaper column, he edited two magazines. He also wrote 100,000 letters to people ranging from Groucho Marx to Herbert Hoover. But there's other material, new material never revealed, that gives us fresh glimpses of Mencken, gathered from 60 different libraries from all over the country and Germany. There's love letters and FBI files and White House memos and the unpublished diaries and memoirs kept by Mencken's secretaries and his lovers and uh, fellow reporters. You know, someone once said that, pe that women like writing biographies because they enjoy reading other people's mail. Well, in that case, I'm guilty. Because, you know, I get bored just reading about what Mencken has to say about Mencken. I also like reading the letters that Mencken's contemporaries wrote to each other with their insights about his influence and their gossip about his love life. And there's also material that's so new, it's not even in libraries. Uh, so many generously search their attics for papers or loan their collections to me. Now, what Mencken said he looked for in a biography was a story. A story that provides illuminations into someone's character so that the subject becomes vividly alive. And some of my favorite details comes from this new material. Here's the man, for example, that people say never suffered from writer's block, but who becomes so depressed after his mother dies that all he can do is sit at his typewriter and stare into space. And the man, for all his bragging and self-esteem, who says he always considered himself a failure. And when you take all this material together, a rounded picture of Mencken begins to form. We see the public Mencken, the American iconoclast that we celebrate here tonight, the man who predicted on some great and glorious day, 
the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. <laughs> the writer who opposed the telephone, saying no man can hear his telephone ring without wishing heartily that Alexander Graham Bell had been run over by an ice wagon at the age of four. Imagine what he would have said of cell phones. <laughs> and the man who wrote, heave an egg out of a Pullman window and you'll hit a fundamentalist almost anywhere in the United States today. And there also emerges from all of this new material a picture of the private Mencken, the man who tried to hide from his future biographers all the evidence of his love affairs. Mencken's friends called him the German Valentino. They used to say, how's the great lover? Well, women were fascinated by Mencken, and he was fascinated by them. I don't know if you know this, but Mencken was the inspiration behind Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Anita Luz wrote it one evening after Mencken was paying more attention to a blonde than to her. He was also known as America's best-known bachelor, the patron saint of single men, the man who famously maintained that a man may be a fool and not know it, but not if he's married. <laughs> the man who said bachelors know more about women than married men, if not, they'd be married too. Now, there is an entire soap opera about Mencken's love life in this book. And then, just when this bachelor ends up finding real happiness in his marriage, his wife tragically dies five years later of tuberculosis. Now, as uh, you can gather from my talk here tonight, writing the biography of another person becomes, in many ways, an effort to rec recreate, by selection, the texture of a life. I moved back to Baltimore to be in the city that Mencken loved, to walk the streets that he walked, what the biographer Richard Holmes calls a tracking of someone's path through the past to bring it alive in the present. And you know, I think most biographers feel this way. David McCullough speaks of a tactile connection, the feeling that we get when we work with documents and from visiting a historic place. There's the connection that we get with Mencken when we handle one of his original letters and can trace his spidery signature, and in one of them, see the circular print and the blot of foam left by his beer mug that has smeared the ink. Well, that physical connection that we get with Mencken is the same feeling we get when we visit his house. And that's why it's such a shame that the Mencken House Museum in Baltimore is closed, bare of the books and the sidles, all the layers of personal history that a biographer just can't get from microfilm. And I truly hope that one day this house can be saved. Now, you're thinking, why should we care? because it's through places that we get the feeling for the person who lived there. More than anything else, they send us back to the writer's work. The same feeling we get when we visit uh, Samuel Johnson's house in London or uh, Ernest Hemingway house in Key West. It, it just brings the person's work alive. And it's shameful because Mencken loved Baltimore. Now, there's a lot about Baltimore in this book, but I also try to capture how the country felt about Mencken when he came upon the American scene as something exciting and new. During a period when, just as now, the press was under scrutiny and the Bill of Rights under attack. Now, 50 years after Mencken's death, Mencken's America does not seem that much different from our own. It was a world of evangelical Christians hostile to science, a world where there was a split between the rural areas and the cities, with a climate of censorship and prejudice and attacks on dissenters. But it's the timelessness of Mencken's views and the vividness of his language that are central to a consideration of his life. Now, young people could learn a great deal today about, from Mencken's writing because his vocabulary numbered over 25,000 words. He brought uh, real adrenaline to the gray and pulpy style of the day. He refused to use cliches. He was called America's George Bernard Shaw. 
with a wit like Oscar Wilde, but he was a force that believed in liberty above all else. Mencken's defense of liberty is evident in his series of reports on the Scopes trial. He believed that religion should not be injected into the study of science in school classrooms. Now, I travel to Dayton, Tennessee to do research, and you won't be surprised to hear that there are those who still regard Mencken as the stinker and think that Clarence Darrow basically killed William Jennings Bryan with his inquisition. If so, as Mencken said, that was a job of public sanitation that Darrow never regretted. Mencken's belief in free speech is also seen when Mencken was arrested in Boston when he sold a copy of his censored magazine to the head of an outfit which lived up to Mencken's definition of a Puritan. Mencken defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. Mencken's fight for free speech is seen again when he took over the editorial page of the Baltimore Evening Sun. Now, Mencken called the editorial page journalism's grandest failure. How many read it, he asked. You know, it reminds me of a complaint of an editor. It's disgusting, but it's very appropriate. He said, editorial writing is like wetting your pants in a blue serge suit. It gives you a nice warm feeling all over and nobody notices. <laughs> now, any journalist who wants to have his work read should take a look at H.L. Mencken. He not only made his readers laugh, but he made them question and he made them think. I think we're going to see a Mencken revival. In the reviews that are coming in for this book, they all be say they're all saying the same thing. Oh, Mencken, where are you now when we need you? Now, it's tempting to make parallels with his day and ours, but what I've tried to do in this book is to put Mencken in the context of his times. Now, people have asked me over and over again if Mencken was a bigot. Now, certainly Mencken could be unfair. He could arouse feelings of betrayal in those who would blindly set him up as an idol. There's no question, he was a man of contradictions, and I explore those contradictions in this book. Here was a man who wrote against prejudice, yet who held many of his own. Here's a man who wrote against tyrants, who wrote against Hitler, but only in private, whose sentimental attachment and loyalty to his German ancestry seems to have made him insensitive, like so many Americans were insensitive, to the first rumors of Nazi atrocities during World War II. And it's disappointing, isn't it? One expects better. But then consider this, when Roosevelt was doing nothing to open the gates for Jewish refugees, when the pre prevailing mood of the country was anti-Semitic, when Walter Lippmann was writing in the pages of Time magazine to send all the immigrant Jews to Africa, would a bigot be going against the grain and writing a column saying, open the gates? And would a bigot be among those who sponsored Jewish families to come to the United States? And when it comes to African Americans, and here again is where Mencken again has been criticized, would a bigot in the face of personal danger be writing against lynching when no one was doing so? And this is 1917 and the 1930s. And would a bigot be the first white editor to publish the works of black authors in his magazine? For example, the work of Langston Hughes and others. And then promote their work to other Americans. And Last, I'll ask you, would a bigot be, be writing against segregation, as Mencken did, and entertain African Americans in his house? You know, these are the paradoxes that we see in complicated figures in history. Mencken used to wonder how people would view him after he was dead. It doesn't matter what people think of me, he said. What matters is what I've done. And what he did was considerable, because for all his faults, he was a defender of freedom above all else. And freedom is Mencken's mantra. It's the running theme throughout this book. When Mencken develops as a literary critic, we see him battle for freedom from the Victorian Anglophile tradition that stifled American literature. Many of the writers that we know today are the writers that Mencken promoted. And then Mencken fought for civil liberties for, for whites and blacks. And finally, during the two world wars, we see Mencken fight for freedom of the press. 
And I'd like to concentrate on this last point because I think if you take the two world wars and the journalism for that period, you'll begin, better begin to understand the free speech issues which were so important to Mencken that even led to his myopia about the war. Now, we all know that all of us are the result of various influences, but one cannot underestimate how much the First World War and the time leading up to it affected Mencken. Because as a German-American, World War I really turned Mencken's life upside down. Pacifists were jailed. Children who refused to sing the national anthem in school were suspended. The Department of Justice spied on American citizens. The German language disappeared. Even food was renamed. The hamburger became the Liberty Sandwich. And in the patriotic fervor that existed, support for the war could be seen everywhere. In Washington, right here in Washington, senators in those days wore little enameled American flags on their coat lapels. And any newspaper editor that offered any negative discussion of the war could face 20 years in prison. Now, in his newspaper columns, Mencken tried to provide a balance. Well, as you can imagine, Mencken's stand provoked a lot of criticism. And looking back to this period, Mencken wrote, the kinds of courage I really admire are not whooped up in war, but cried down. No one in such times ever praises the man who seeks to restore the national thinking to a reasonable sanity. On the contrary, he's regarded as a shabby and evil fellow. Now, does it surprise you when I tell you that once again, here at home, Mencken is being called un-American. Yet no one battled harder for the Bill of Rights than H.L. Mencken. People from other countries recognized this, re recognized this. In Europe, they called Mencken one of the most genuinely American things that we have. Now, with all this talk of free speech, it's not surprising that when we come to World War II, Mencken takes the same stand as he did in World War I. Now, one cannot talk about Mencken's reaction to World War II without discussing Mencken's reaction to Franklin Roosevelt. Why did Mencken seem to have such a hatred towards FDR? Well, there were Roosevelt's social programs, for one thing. Although they did so much to help the underclass, Mencken recognized none of it. Another reason that Mencken was against Roosevelt was because of the president's blemishes regarding civil rights. And this has never been examined very much, but this was really a key point with Mencken. There was the internment of Japanese Americans, and also the way Roosevelt did nothing, nothing to stop the lynchings that were taking place around the country. And it was Mencken, in fact, who joined forces with the NAACP to stop these atrocities. And I've already mentioned Mencken's columns about opening the doors to uh, Jewish refugees escaping from Nazi Germany. But one of the main reasons why Mencken disliked Roosevelt was how he eroded freedom of the press. And clues to this can be found in Mencken's unedited original versions of his papers. Now, I'm very much aware that sometimes Mencken can embellish a story at the expense of fact. So every time I came across something horrid that Mencken said about Roosevelt or accused him of, of doing that seemed way over the top, I decided to check it out for myself in Roosevelt's papers at Hyde Park. And what I found there is not very savory about a president who has accomplished so many things for this country. And don't get me wrong, this is not revisionist history. Among the papers at Hyde Park, you'll find in FDR a skillful politician who wiretapped newspaper men who he didn't like, who used the FBI to intimidate journalists, whose own attorney general wrote privately in his diary that he couldn't believe the liberties that its president had taken, who used the Justice Department and other government agencies to attain private ends. Now, Mencken was not the only reporter who was aware of these things during this time. Others knew about it. But Mencken was not writing for his paper by then and no one else wrote about it 
because with the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the unity of the American public had locked into place. But it's in times like these, Mencken said, where we confront the greatest challenge to the press, especially when a president is popular, and especially when the country is at war. As Mencken said, it's the role of the press not to get cozy with politicians, but as he put it, to, put, to keep a wary eye on the gentlemen who run this great nation and only too often slip into the assumption that they own it. Now, an adroit president can wield a great deal of power when the press is mediocre. And Mencken understood this very well. Shortly afterwards, Mencken suffered a stroke leaving him unable to read or write. There was a time when Mencken used to rub his hands over his desk. He really enjoyed the feel of the wood. And now that's all the desk was good for. And as the years of Mencken's illness wore on, as the 1950s wore on, a slow creeping inertia set out across the country. As never before, Americans had become cautious and silent. Statistics show that many Americans were watching TV five hours a day. You know, what tends to be forgotten about Mencken was his courage. It was the one virtue that Mencken most admired. It was Mencken's courage that made him speak out against things that were wrong when no one else was doing so. Which brings me back again to the question, why should there be another biography on Mencken? Well, to answer that, I'd like to share with you something that William Manchester sent to me shortly before he died. It's a small piece he wrote. He said, 50 years ago, I spent my mornings reading to an old man who suffered, as I now suffer, from a series of strokes. He was a writer. He was H.L. Mencken. I have never known a kinder man but when he unsheathed his typewriter and sharpened its keys, his prose was anything but kind. It was rollicking and it was ferocious. Witty intellectual polemicists are a vanishing breed today. Their role has been usurped by television boobs whose IQs measure just below their body temperatures. Some journalism schools even warn their students to shun words that may hurt but sometimes words should hurt. That's why they're in the language. When terrorists slaughter innocents, when corporation executives swindle shareholders, when lewd priests betray the trust of little children, it's time to mobilize the language and send it into battle. When Mencken died in January 1956, he was cremated. That was a mistake. He should have been rolled in malleable gold and polished to blind the cosmos. I still miss him. America misses him more. Thank you. Thank you very much. For folks with questions, please feel free to raise your hands. Yes, go ahead. I think by now, aren't you glad you stumped over that box of letters in the Goucher College Library? <laughs> Yes, uh, the story is that some of you may know that um, in 1981, when I was a student at Goucher College, I was writing a feature story for our school newspaper on Sarah Hart. And Sarah Hart was an alumna from the school, and she was the woman whom Mencken later married. And uh, klutz that I am, I tripped over this box which said, do not open until 1981, signed H.L. Mencken. And the year was 1981. And that coincidence uh, led me on a different path, which led to Mencken and Sarah, and then uh, The Impossible H.L. Mencken, which was a selection of his best newspaper stories, and now with this. But I think I'm going to stop with this. <laughs> Any other? Yes. Uh, I have the Library of Congress interview that Mencken did in the late 40s. And I wonder if you know of any other filmed or recorded interviews that uh, are extant. Yes. This, uh, this Library of Congress interview that the gentleman is referring to 
was one that he uh, recorded in the summer of 1948. Actually, it was close to September, so he was suffering from hay fever. You can hear his sniffling throughout the uh, interview. Um, and it was just a few months shortly before he had a stroke and was unable to give such interviews. And there's a few other recordings, actually, at the Library of Congress, uh, radio recordings of not so much interviews, but um, uh, radio shows. One was about prohibition and beer. And it's about much younger Mencken. It's very interesting to hear the voice, how much younger it sounds. And that would have been in, in the 1930s. And then, um, in terms of films, there are some films, actually, uh, among Alfred Knopf's papers at the University of Texas, uh, the Harry Ransom Humanity Research Center. And uh, uh, Alfred Knopf was a very well-known photographer, if for those of you who don't know that. He took wonderful pictures of all kinds of writers that he published. And he also has this brief little film strip of Mencken. And, and there's another one as well that uh, another person from Baltimore had taken. And when I first saw this film strip, it, it was such a shock because here I had spent all these years studying Mencken and studying his photographs, getting lost in these photographs. And then to have this man spring to life in, on film, it was like seeing a ghost. And I had uh, vivid dreams for weeks afterwards. <laughs> yes? There's also a film, I believe, called Mencken's America, made by Channel 2 in Baltimore, by Gwyn Owens, who is the son of Hamilton Owens, who worked with Mencken at the Sun Papers. Yes, that is. And that was the time I knew it on 33, you know, very old format. Right. But I hope it's been transferred. Yes. Uh, uh uh, this is the film by Gwyn Owens called Mencken's America. I believe it was made in the 1950s. And, uh, and so there's that film as well. You're right. Uh, yes? Uh, I noticed in your book you have a chapter on the Scopes trial, and there were two big trials in mid-1920s America, and the other one was the Leopold and Loeb trial, yes. which was also a Clarence Darrow case. And I'm wondering if Mencken uh, made any comment or had anything to say about that case. Yes, um, he he wrote. A, I th he mentions it from time to time. The um, the the famous uh, Leopold Loeb case that Clarence Darrow uh, uh, did, but it was this case, the Scopes trial, uh, the Scopes monkey trial, as it was called in 1925, that Mencken is best remembered for. Uh, for some of you who don't know, that was called in those days the trial of the century. I know there's been many since then. And uh, it was the trial where John Scopes was arrested for teaching the theory of evolution in school. And it was Clarence Darrow who elicited Mencken's help uh, to, to help out with his trial and Mencken's columns that became syndicated all over the country and which uh, elicited a great deal of fury. Uh, there was a question back there, yes? Comment on the accusation that Mencken was a mama's boy. Oh. Yes, uh, from time to time, uh, especially recently, people have said uh, that Mencken was a mama's boy. But uh, quite frankly, um, I really find that phrase rather patronizing because uh, if we put Mencken back in the context of his times, uh, in those days, uh, a bachelor uh, and an, uh, who had a mother living at home and sisters, uh, in Mencken's case, one sister, he wouldn't have left the house. He would have stayed to be the man of the house. But everybody's going around saying that Mencken was a mama's boy, which is, is very wrong. He adored his mother. He was very close to his mother. But uh, to call him that is, is a bit wrong. Yes? Did uh, Mencken believe in democratic institutions? I know he didn't feel that people were a great repository of wisdom. <laughs> right. Well, that's coming from uh, about Mencken and, and uh, democratic institutions. Uh, one of Mencken's uh, words that he coined, which uh, some of you may f be familiar with, he talked about the bourgeoisie, the great mass of democracy. Um, he always said that he wrote for the civilized minority. And uh, he believed in the democratic institutions. I mean, after all, Mencken was a great proponent of free speech and the Bill of Rights, and so um, he always considered himself a lifelong Democrat. So yes, he believed in those, but you wouldn't think so by uh, 
coming across his work. And in fact, uh, maybe that's why a certain congressman to this day are calling Mencken un-American. <laughs> yes? Of, uh, civil rights, but um, is it true that he was very really pro-Confederate and Lincoln? Pro-Confederate? Yes. No, no, he wasn't pro-Confederate. What what Mencken what Mencken admired was um, Virginia and the uh, the certain civility from Virginia, but he wasn't pro-Confederate. He didn't believe in slavery. But what he what he truly disliked was Abraham Lincoln. He said that the way Abraham Lincoln manipulated the press, um, and so that was something he wrote against. Yes? You mentioned that he's hard to characterize as being on either the left or the right, and I've heard this tossed about. Would it, would it be accurate to characterize him as one of the first real libertarians, like Albert J. Nock or someone like that? Yes. Was, was, uh, would I characterize Mencken as one of the first real libertarians? Yes, he was, because he always prided himself in his independence. Um, just now I was saying that Mencken considered himself a lifelong Democrat. His views, uh, especially in the beginning of this century, were considered very liberal. And that's why when Mencken uh, switched and was against uh, FDR's New Deal programs, people began seeing him as very conservative. But actually Mencken had never really changed. He had always he had always stuck to uh, uh, the belief of independence, and so that's what makes him libertarian. Uh, another question back hey, there. Can you uh, comment on how you think Mencken might have regarded the current controversy over the right of re <coughs> reporters to uh, keep the confidentiality of their sources? Yes, how I re would regard um, how Mencken would view uh, reporters who try and keep the confidentiality of their sources. Well, I had that marvelous uh, quote about um, uh, where he said that uh, po reporters should never become too cozy with politicians, that they should keep, keep the presidents, keep politicians always under the glare of light. And in fact, uh, during the Roosevelt era, when uh, many reporters in the White House press corps were getting very, very cozy with, uh, with the president and his people. They were going to clam bakes and all kinds of things. Mencken purposely said, uh, put himself back. He refused to go because, as he said, I'd hate to come under the influence of FDR's Christian science smile. He knew that Roosevelt was very charming, and uh, he wanted to keep his objectivity. Uh, before you, I think there was another question right here. Sorry. If you look at some of the great American writers that talked about what was happening in our country, Mark Twain, Ambrose Bierce, a hundred years later, what would it take to produce another writer of the quality of H.L. <laughs> Well, I think we're living, what would it take to produce another writer of the quality of H.L. Mencken? Um, I think we're living in those times now. Uh, there are a lot of writers that uh, people equate with Mencken. Uh, P.J. O'Rourke is one. The biting language of Maureen Dowd is another. But what makes Mencken so very unique is the cadence of his language. There's a strain of, a mu of the musician in Mencken, which I talk about in this book. But it's also that he was such a Renaissance man. I mean, here he was uh, changing the course of American literature with his magazines, um, had studied science, knew so much about law. And so if we wanted to produce another Mencken, it's not only the times, but it's also someone of that stature and that intelligence and that talent, really. Yes. Uh, early on, Mencken wrote that you would never accept a ticket to something you're going to review. Never, uh, never have a, accept a ticket to something you're going to review. Right. Right, right. You're absolutely right. Yes. Well, as far as uh, Mencken and journalistic ethics go, um, he's quite famous for the bathtub hoax, for example. But I know in your <laughs> book you also mention a few other news items that uh, Mencken was uh, not fully honest about, especially regarding the uh, Russo-Japanese War early on. Yeah, I'm right. just wondering whether that's something that ended pretty much in that period, or whether uh, later on he continued to come up with hoaxes, which people may or may not reali have realized were uh, right. not quite honest. Well, Mencken, there's a, there's a bit of the of a Peck's bad boy in Mencken. He has a lot of mischief. 
And uh, the, the um, hoax or the, 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 the story that you're referring to was in 1904. Now, this is in his autobiography, and he's very proud of it. He's, he writes about this in the 1940s. And uh, it was when his, his first paper, the Baltimore, Baltimore Morning Herald, was um, losing readers. And, um, you know, in those days, we didn't have the telephone, we didn't have CNN, <laughs> we didn't have all kinds of things. And so no one knew what was happening with the Russo-Japanese War. And all these papers were scrambling to get the first lead. And so Mencken decided that the way he was going to bring his paper back to life was if he studied the battle plans, he could kind of fudge it. And so he did. I mean, he, he wrote about the battle, he, um, different battleships. He used, he used facts, but he kind of stretched a little. And in his autobiography, he says, well, you know, all these years later, I was still right. But the fact, fact was, if you go back to the original papers of that period, you see that a lot of readers of the Herald had noticed that he had lied. And they started questioning him about it. Now, Again, in 1905, the year later, um, a lot of journalists were being questioned about made-up stories here and there in the press because it wasn't as harsh in those days as now. And, um, and so Mencken came out and said in an interview that falsifications would have to die and that that sort of thing couldn't be done. And it's only much later in his life that he... Um, that he stretches the truth a little, but that's when he's writing his memoirs, that three volumes that I would suggest highly to all of you if you haven't read them, Happy Days, Newspaper Days, and Heathen Days. And I forgot to mention, you're right, there was the bathtub hoax in 1917 when he uh, invented the history of the bathtub. And he, uh, he talked about, you know, the bathtub in the White House and the different presidents that had used the bathtub, and he went on and on. And, um, you know, and in the 40s, Harry Truman was giving tours to the White House, and he was mentioning the history of the bathtub, and it just went on. And uh, Mencken had to finally put a, a stop to this bathtub hoax. But with Mencken, under the humor, there's always a serious purpose, because when he was writing this bathtub hoax in 1917, um, uh, th there had been a lot of false stories in the press, and he was really making fun of the gullibility of Americans who believe anything. And so I think his bathtub hoax was not only a way to have fun, but just to, to uh, test the climate. Yes. Uh, there uh, was an embargo placed on Mencken's paper, papers for a period after his death. I wonder if those are all available now. Yes, uh, Mencken imposed three different embargoes on his paper. It was 1961, 1971, and 1981. And those, those were done in different stages. Jonathan Yardley says that maybe he did it that way so that he'd always be talked about. There's probably a lot of truth to that. And, there, and when it came to his memoirs, uh, 35 years of newspaper work and my life as author and editor, uh, which was a set of memoirs that he never finished writing before his stroke, um, the reason he put that embargo last was because he didn't want the people that he was talking about to still be alive when those papers came out. He didn't want their feelings hurt. Yes? Was he beloved during Prohibition by the people in uh, Baltimore in the social circles, or was it a love-hate type of relationship? Or? Well, everyone loved what Mencken was saying about prohibition, because during those 13 awful years that prohibition was enforced, people were really suffering. I mean, <laughs> I mean, people were brewing uh, bathtub gin in their bathtubs and going blind. Uh, a lot of people were brewing beer and getting sick as a result. And uh, there was a lot of drunkenness going on. There was actually more drunkenness than the prohibitionists ever wanted. Um, and so, so people really liked what he was saying, and he drummed the point again, home again, more and more, because he thought prohibition was against our civil rights. In fact, I would say that today, the fact that you can go out and have a beer is really thanks to Mencken. And uh, when prohibition finally came to an end in 1932, uh, it was the press that focused on him, and in Baltimore at the Rennert Hotel, uh, he is 
the picture, in fact, which is the cover of this book, is Mencken having the first beer of Prohibition, and all the cameras are popping, and he says, not bad, fill it again. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Marian, I know you obviously had to do a lot of research for this book, but was there any particular part of the research that you found more satisfying than others? Well, uh, the research was a lot of fun because uh, Mencken is so amusing and you never know what you're going to find. So, so the Mencken room at the Enoch Pratt Free Library is a place that you always hear people laughing. And, uh, but what I can tell you what I found really the most painful. And what I found the most painful was when I was writing about Mencken's relationship with women. Uh, there was one woman named Marion Bloom that he courted on and off. And there was another uh, movie actress named Eileen Pringle, who was a silent film star in the 1920s. She had everything going for her. And she really made herself become victimized by Mencken's behavior. Because this was a celebrity. This was a man who could have anybody. And. Uh, but what, what Mencken used to do, he had a habit of always telling women that uh, when he would break up with them, he would say, okay, now um, I'm returning all the letters you wrote to me, and now you re return all the letters that I wrote to you, and I'm going to burn them, and you should do the same thing. And a lot of these women obeyed. They would, you know, there would be this exchange of letters. And so when Eileen got her packet of letters that she had written to Mencken, and she wrote to him every single day, these are a heart on your sleeve kind of letters, uh, she thought twice about it. I mean, what is a woman to do? <laughs> so she kept these letters, and she gave them to Yale University. And, the, and what's very nice about these letters is it's not lopsided. It's actually very revealing, because you, you sense what's going on. Uh, with Mencken and with Eileen, and she kept a, f a little sprinkling of his letters as well. And she said to him, my letters will haunt you beyond the grave.